have a very full room and an overflow as well. And I don't have COVID, I just have a bad cold and I don't want to share it around. Um, but thank you all very much for being here for what I think is going to be a really terrific panel. Uh, Australian aid effectiveness, where to from here? Um, aid has always been one of the better evaluated of all government expenditures, but that doesn't mean it's good enough and it can't be done better. And I think that's what we're here to learn from our panellists about today. We're very lucky to have three excellent panellists. Um, Andrew Lee, who is not here yet because he's in Parliament doing condolence for, for Peter Murphy, but he'll be here shortly. Um, I think you all know him. He's the Assistant Treasurer, Minister for Charities, Not-for-Profits and Competition, which is an interesting mix, um, and was formerly a professor at ANU. But we also have here with us Claire Cullen. Claire is a postdoctoral fellow at the Blatavnik School of Government at Oxford. Um, she's head of a research for Youth Impact, which is a Botswana-based organisation committed to scaling up evidence-based programs for youth. She was also, prior to that, at AusAid, has worked for UNICEF and on Innovations for Poverty Action. And the other person who you will no doubt know well is Stephen Howes, who's now a director at the Development Policy Centre here at ANU. He, we dragged him over, I think it was Difford we dragged you from, wasn't it? When you're AusAid, uh, World Bank, that's right, via Difford, I think. Uh, um, as he was the chief economist there from 2005 to 2007 and was pretty critical in setting up the Office for Development Effectiveness. So um, uh, now I'm going to ask Claire to come up first and talk to you about what she's talking about then followed by Stephen and then Andrew will come in when he gets here and then we'll have some interesting Q&A. Thank you. Thanks, Claire. Thanks so much. And thanks so much to the organisers of the conference for hosting uh, this panel about my favourite topics ever, evidence and impact. So I'm going to focus on the question of how rigorous uh, evaluation and learning can be embedded in organisations. Under the umbrella of how to deliver good programs, evidence and evaluation usually feature, uh, but a focus on measuring implementation well rarely does. I want to discuss how we've done this in our education programs at Youth Impact, where I work. I'll emphasize that evaluation is really important, but also just focusing on evaluation is not enough. To get the most out of the evidence and to achieve impact, you need all the elements of evaluation and implementation to be working together. This might sound obvious, but I can't tell you how rare I think it is in many organizations to take implementation piece as seriously as the standard m and &E piece when considering evidence. I come at these questions from a few angles. Previously, as a donor and funder in AusAid and DFAT, then uh, in like pure academia as a researcher, then as a hybrid researcher uh, funder in the World Bank, and now as the head of research at an implementation NGO that translates evidence into action. And I'm excited to share some reflections from wearing these different hats. So at DFAT, I was very new in my career, I was very green, and I think I had a little too much faith that what was written in the policy was translated to action and impact on the ground. I think similarly in research, I also had a little too much faith that was what was written in the theory of change or in the theoretical model uh, was actioned in reality. Now at an implementing organization, I see just how rare and hard it is to get things moving and to implement well. But getting this right is everything. I now think about implementation all of the time. Without implementation, there is no impact, and yet implementation is so often an unsexy afterthought. This is an evidence panel, so let me show you some evidence that we should be spending much more time thinking about measuring implementation as a fundamental part of good evidence. I want to start with a question. What would you say is the typical story of trying to scale a program? I would say that the common story is probably something like this, that there's a really successful pilot when everyone is, there's like a hothouse focus on really great training, everyone has an incentive to make it work, there's small numbers so you can manage it really well, and then you run an RCT, if you're really lucky it then gets scaled up, and then it might putter out and fail to scale. Uh, and it is, like maybe in this new, like, uh, scaled up version, it is, maybe it was like scaled up too quickly, maybe the, there was too much cost cutting too quickly, maybe it's a new context or a new implementer. Uh, and it, implementation and impact is really hard. 
And the common story can feel really depressing. And if it's the, that's the case, it might feel like a lottery, whether positive evidence translates from one context to the next or from pilot to scale. But I want to give one example that gives us some hope and highlights the power of focusing on implementation together with evaluation. At Youth Impact, we scale up evidence-based programs to young people. We have a large in-house research team, and data and evidence is in our DNA. This means that when COVID came, we were in a really good position to quickly pivot from our, uh, we typically deliver teaching at the right level, which is a really solid evidence-based program in education, and we pivoted to being able to deliver it over the phone as a one-on-one -on -one tutorial. Uh, we ran a randomized control trial of this program, generating the world's first RCT evidence in education during COVID, and we found that it worked. We were then approached by governments, multilaterals, and NGOs around the world wanting to replicate it and see if it worked in their context. So we ran randomized trials in these five new countries, and here is a rough chart of the program's impact as we scaled. It worked everywhere, but the impact on learning got bigger and bigger as we went to each country. When unpacking this positive story of scale, we observed that this impact pattern lined up with the implementation quality pattern. Implementation quality is in the blue line here, more or less. This is consistent with a story that implementation can improve over time, and with increasing implementation, we found increasing impact. So what do we take from all of this? How do we use evidence to successfully scale programs and have the happy curve rather than the sad curve? First, collecting evidence is useful. Well-designed evidence can tell us if things work and why. Second, programs can be successfully taken to scale. Some ingredients that increase the chance of taking things to scale are quality implementation being valued and measured well, and also conducting replications to see if things translate across contexts. Finally, we sometimes think of evaluation as a once-off and a stamp of approval. It should actually be part of an ongoing learning process. After one evaluation and multiple replications, what next? So for example, at Youth Impact, once we know a program is effective, we then run rigorous A-B tests every school term to optimize and improve cost effectiveness as we scale. To increase the chance of impact and successfully translating evidence to new contexts, we should also give implementation its moment in the sun. We should spend a lot more time thinking about how to do it well, value it, and measure it to connect the dots between evidence and impact. Thank you. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to participate in this panel. Uh, I just want to completely endorse uh, the emphasis Claire's given to uh, bringing implementation and evaluation together. Uh, but I am going to pivot somewhat because uh, my job is to provide a historical perspective uh, on this question of where to from here. I'm sort of looking at how did, how did we get to where we are. And uh, I'm sure we all agree, you know, if we want to move, in, improve things in the future, we need to study the past. Uh, that said, I did find it very difficult to actually prepare these remarks. I was told I've only got five minutes, it's a very short time, and there's so much that has happened, so much that could be said. So I'm just going to talk in my limited time about a few changes over the last 20 years in the way the Australian Aid Program is evaluated, uh, some good, some bad. And let me start, you know, with three positive changes that I've observed. And I'll just caveat, I'm going to go beyond evaluation uh, strictly uh, to also look at performance management. I, I think it's worth putting it into the discussion, uh, especially when, you know, a lot of the investments Australia supports, you know, let's face it, they don't, uh, they're, they're not easily, uh, they don't lend themselves to impact evaluation. Uh, but f they can still, you know, you can still make a judgment about their performance. And having that uh, contestability at least internally, where you make judgments about performance, and at the end of the day, those judgments are published. I think that, that can be very useful. So, yeah, as Jenny said, my involvement with the Australian Aid Program began uh, when I was hired as AusAid's chief economist in 2005. And when I arrived, one thing I noticed was there was very little centralised performance management of the aid portfolio, certainly less than I was used to at the World Bank where I've been working. It, it seemed a bit like the Wild West to me. And so I suggested we target Chris Hoban, another Australian, who had been operations manager in the World Bank's Delhi office. I'd also been based in Delhi working with Chris. And so Chris became AusAid's principal operations advisor. I always think he did an amazing job in a short time, and perhaps that was my best contribution, was to bring him on board. 
With his help, the system of investment monitoring that continues to this day was set up. And overall, my sense is that that system has stood the test of time. So that's the first positive. Now, I don't know all the details about how it's evolved over time, but I do know in, in some ways it's been improved. There was a big improvement in 2019 when the final ratings for projects or investments, as we meant to call them, were taken out of the hands of project managers and made the responsibility of a central unit. That caused a big drop in rated performance, uh, which we've written about, but making the final ratings more independent was a significant step forward, I think. So that's my second positive reform. Uh, now on to evaluation. I think the evaluation of the Australian Aid Program has also been strengthened over the last two decades. So although I, lost, I, I left AusAid, I got to have a second look at the aid program in 2011 when I worked on the independent review of aid effectiveness. We found then that only about one quarter of the evaluations that were meant to have been done over the last five years had been done. And of this completed number, only two thirds could be found <laughs> and only one fifth had been published. It took a while for reform in this area to get off the ground, but in, in 2016, or since 2016, uh, DFAT has taken a different approach. Rather than requiring that all projects be evaluated and then falling well short, targeting a smaller number, making the, its evaluation plans public, and then following through. It's a much more credible process and one that's worked well. So there's an important lesson here. It's better to have a more modest or realistic performance and evaluation framework and implement it rather than have a very ambitious but unrealistic one on paper and then fell well short. So that's my third positive change. So I know some people will dismiss these changes as cosmetic and the processes that underlie them as theatre. That is, they'll say the existing performance management and evaluation requirements might be complied with, but they aren't really taken seriously. And that's certainly true to some extent. I think we can all think of cases like that. But at the same time, these processes are not just theatre. They're also sometimes useful, and the aid program would definitely be worse without them. So it's not all doom and gloom. While it's easy to focus on the negative and what needs to be done to improve, there have been gains in the past. And nor is it simply a story of AusAid good versus DFAT bad. It's more complex than that. At the same time, I don't want to pretend that everything is positive. I'm sure we can all think of ways in which the system can be improved or taken more seriously. So I'll conclude with my one negative reform. So as we all know, in 2021, the Office of Development Effectiveness and the Independent Evaluation Committee that sat above it was abolished. I know some people think ODE had lost its way and that the abolition of it and the IEC was justified or at least no great loss. However, I think, I have a different view. I think we have to look at things from an institutional perspective. There are definitely forces in our sector that conspire against robust contestability and rigorous evaluation. You just have to think about the public diplomacy role that DFAT's called to play on, to called on to play to understand that. But there are much broader forces within government, and indeed uh, within the aid sector, government and non-government, that make it difficult for us to be critical, to talk about failure. That tend to make us operate, in Bill Eastley's famous words, like a cartel of good intentions. And you can just look at this conference, in fact, and the blog, where the number of sessions or articles documenting failure uh, are very rare, and those celebrating success much more the standard fare. So countervailing institutions are needed to push back uh, on that, on those tendencies, and to support good processes of performance management and impact evaluation. Uh, Andrew's not here, but I'm sure he's going to talk about uh, his new evaluation centre in Treasury, and that's one such countervailing institution, which is government-wide. And ODE and the IEC were countervailing institutions, you know, first within AusAid and then within DFAT, with an oversight and championing role in relation not only to evaluations, but also performance management. In fact, uh, two of the three positive reforms that I've highlighted in these brief remarks uh, were the result of ODE you know, and or IEC pressure and initiatives. So the abolition of these two institutions you know, was, in my view, definitely a backward step. Uh, that said, it's not an accident that, you know, if you look at what I've said, uh, at a simplistic level, I've got three positives and one negative. It's not a comprehensive analysis, but I guess it, it does reflect my overall belief that in this area of evaluation performance management, uh, we have made more progress than regress in the last 20 years. And of course, I hope that continues. Thank you.
I'll commandeer a mic and won't hand it over so nobody gets my cold. Um, Andrew, I'm sure, will be here very soon. Oh, good, we've got an extra one. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you. I, I was remiss because I forgot to acknowledge the, uh, the First Nations people who, uh, who have never ceded the land on which we meet today, and that's the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people, so um, my apologies. Ah, Andrew's on his way. I'm going to ask you a question anyway while we wait for, <laughs> wait for Andrew. <laughs> um, so, Claire, that was really interesting hearing about implementation. Why do you think um, evaluation has not actually, and theories of change don't include all the challenges of implementation? Why are we making assumptions that obviously don't hold um, and our theory of change should actually be making assumptions about whether things are implementable or not? So I'll hand that one over to you while we wait for Andrew to get his, get his mic. Awesome. Um, thanks for that question. Yeah, I guess there must be a few reasons, and I'm sure this room is full of ideas as well. Uh, I guess part of it is incentives, of course, that it's just not valued. So don't want to denigrate my fellow economists, but in an economics paper, everything is focused on the identification strategy. And like, if you talk about the content of what's being studied, it's usually in the appendix. So I do think the incentives in a lot of academia certainly are not to talk too much about the content. Um, and then I guess, yeah, it just matters what, what people are valuing and talking about. And it's, I guess, when I was at like a donor perspective, World Bank, DFAT, you're very far from the implementation and you just, you just, it's very easy to read the policy documents, come up with sensible theories of change and then assume that it filters down. And then just now that I, I see, I just see how hard it is to get things done. I think the disconnect it explains a lot of that as well. Okay, I think that's one we need to park and come back to. Um, and we also have Stephen's really good point is that we tend to report positives and don't report the negatives enough to learn from. But Andrew, it's so nice to have you here. Um, over to you. Um, well, thanks, Jenny. Uh, they have a saying in Kenya, uh, all uh, formalities observed. So given that I'm coming in part way through, all formalities observed. Um, thank you for, uh, for having me and uh, uh, for being in the company of two extraordinary presenters uh, whose presentations I have missed out on uh, because the House is sitting today to deliver condolence speeches for our late colleague Peter Murphy, so uh, hence uh, slipping out a little, a little late. Um, I've been a long-time advocate of randomised policy trials, not only in development but also uh, in policy more broadly. Uh, simply put, if you're doing a good evaluation, you need a, clear, a strong counterfactual, uh, and the clearest counterfactual in many contexts comes from the toss of a coin. Uh, that's why you can't get a new drug on the onto the pharmaceutical benefits scheme uh, without it having gone through a randomised trial. Uh, randomised trials aren't perfect, but the idea that they should constitute 0% of our evaluations uh, is as silly as the notion they could constitute 100%. Sadly, right now, we're closer to 0%, certainly in the areas that are being, fun, uh, being driven out of Australia. Uh, that's a pity, I think, because some of the most important findings in development have flowed out of randomised trials. Uh, people who've read uh, William Easterly's book will uh, know that uh, in the early 2000s, there were some, including Easterly, who argued that uh, malaria-treated bed nets uh, should be uh, sold rather than given away. Uh, that if you gave away a bed net, it would be used most likely as a fishing net or a wedding veil rather than used for the intended purpose. Uh, then a series of randomised trials, uh, largely organised out of JPAL, uh, conduct were conducted in uh, four different countries uh, and the result was very clear. Uh, when you gave away bed nets, the take-up was much higher than when you had a co-payment, even if the co-payment was as low as 50 cents. Uh, and free bed nets were equally likely to be used uh, as bed nets that people paid for. That switched practice uh, and has had the effect of saving thousands of lives uh, of people who would otherwise have died by malaria for want of a bed net. Uh, the insights from the bed netting experiment uh, flow through to, to other areas uh, and allow us to more rigorously test our theories. As an economist, one of the things I really like about randomised trials uh, despite the fact that I've done a bunch of natural experiment papers, uh, is that we can tailor the empirics to the theory. 
Uh, that is, we can start with the deep economic theory, a uh, point that Chris Blackman has made, uh, and uh, effectively work out how the trial should be structured in order to learn more about, th about that theory. That meld of theory and practice is really critical to good social science. Uh, the final point I'd make uh, before throwing back into a conversation that I've just walked into the middle of uh, is uh, that in the environment of a replication crisis, randomised trials have the advantage of being far more readily replicable than natural experiments. For a natural experiment, we're looking for uh, quirks of policy or uh, the natural environment or technology that we can exploit in order to learn something about policy efficacy. Uh, in a randomised trial, we're setting up the structure ourselves. Uh, I spoke to, you know, when I was writing my book, Randomisters, spoke to a kidney researcher who said that he now only does multi-country studies. Uh, that's for two reasons. One, that he gets, he ensures that uh, the treatment works across people from a range of different ethnicities. But the other is that by conducting studies in multiple countries, you've got inbuilt replications for what you're doing. Uh, we know that about 3% of researchers fabricate, admit to having fabricated data. Uh, we know we've had a high number of uh, researchers uh, whose studies have been shown to be fragile. Uh, we need to be better in the social sciences at replica replicability uh, and having more randomised trials makes sense. Uh, we've set up the Australian Centre for Evaluation within Treasury, working collaboratively across government, uh, very keen to draw in the expertise uh, of ANU experts, international bodies and dovetail into the uh, exciting body of work that's being done on high quality policy evaluation. Thank you very much, Andrew. Um, so key points coming out are implementation really matters. Theories of change don't adequately reflect all the challenges of implementation. We should be learning more from failure, so how do we actually report it and make sure we learn? Transparency comes into it, so the role of transparency. And there's some interesting issues around RCTs and multi-country studies that I think we want to get into as well. But just to start off, um, Stephen, you've sort of mentioned some positive changes in the evaluation program for DFAT, and we now have a big agenda on, you know, improving development effectiveness. You know, if you can't increase a budget, then you've got to make sure your dollar has a lot more bang for the buck. Um, so taking the good things and building on them, what would you see from the past you would like, apart from just sort of resurrecting ODE and what would, what would you want them to do? If you had an independent committee, what would it actually do? How should it engage so it actually delivers more effective outcomes? Okay, thanks. Thanks, Jenny. Um, I guess so uh, if we, you know, this is where we start to be, I start to be more critical. Um, yeah, when, when you look at the new international development policy, uh, you know, there is a new performance framework. There are some new ambitions uh, around evaluation, you know, but I, I find they're, they're pretty incremental uh, changes. You know, it's like, well, we've already got an evaluation plan, but now we're going to have a multi-year plan, you know, and then we're going to have uh, both sort of longer-term impact studies and, um, you know, short-term sort of more real-time uh, assessments. I mean, I'm sure those are all, all good things, but, um, but I think you've got to go, as I said in my remarks, you know, take more of an institutional perspective and, and ask yourself who's going to drive uh, the changes in, in the right direction and who's going to make sure we don't go backwards, but instead go forwards. And so if you don't mind, I'll return to this uh, subject of the Office of Development Effectiveness and just to take that institutional lens. Uh, in fact, I said while you were out, Andrew, that you, you know, your centre, the centre you're establishing within Treasury, uh, is what I call a countervailing institution. You need institutions specifically tasked to push this agenda forward because they don't sit naturally with the culture, uh, I think generally within government, but certainly within the aid sector. And I think that's totally understandable, you know, as someone myself implement aid programs, no one wants to be told their aid program's not working. And no one, if it's not working, no one wants to publicise that. Um, but, you know, that is, we need that discipline and so we need to set up institutions, I think, that will uh, bring a countervailing uh, pressure or force uh, and, and so push forward the uh, performance management and, and evaluation agenda, whatever form uh, the evaluation takes. 
So, you know, you might think that ODE is a lost cause or that I'm uh, perhaps obsessed by it, but just think, what did we lose by uh, abolishing uh, ODE and the IEC, you know, which was this mainly independent committee uh, that sat above it? I think we, we lost three things. You know, first, uh, ODE was at the branch head level and now evaluations at the uh, section or director level. So it's definitely been demoted and, you know, that sends a lot of things follow from that. You know, DFAT, like any government organisation, is a hierarchical organisation, and the lower you are down that hierarchy, the less important you're going to be taken, the less seriously you're going to be taken. So that was one. Second, um, yeah, ODE and the IEC not only had that evaluation focus, but also performance management. And so, you know, when in the days where we used to have a performance of Australian aid report, uh, you know, the head of the IEC used to sign off on this report. Like, this is a fair appraisal of uh, Australian performance. And then again, as I was saying, you can just say that's theatre. I, of course he's going to sign that it's all right. But I don't, I don't, I'm not that cynical. You know, I think, of course, yes, in the end he's going to say, well, she, it was a he, he's going to say it's okay. But, you know, that's going to put pressure on the system. That's exactly what we want, right? Because, they're, they're, you know, these are serious people. You know, they, they're only going to say it's okay if the, the system's taken seriously. So having that broader uh, sort of second opinion on uh, the performance management system, um, you know, I think was really useful. And... As we've discussed, you know, I think the whole, uh, the shock when performance ratings suddenly went down uh, because they were taken out of project managers, made more independent, you know, I do feel uh, DFAT never kind of came clean on that, never talked about it and was kind of left, well, it was talked about like on page 300 of the annual report. <laughs> but it's like a major development. And I think having a body like ODE and IEC would have helped uh, navigate these kind of, you know, positive but difficult uh, changes. So that's the second thing, that kind of oversight rule. And then, and then the third was, you know, in some ways, the IEC was sort of more important than ODE. IEC was this uh, independent committee. Uh, it wasn't totally independent, but it did kind of strengthen the role of ODE. It was brought in sort of several years after ODE started and I think definitely helped uh, just provide that independence, provide that backbone, and, and you know, you're kind of throwing that away. So, yeah, while clearly this government you know, I'm not quite sure why the last government abolished ODE and IEC. I'm, I'm not quite sure why this government didn't bring it back, didn't bring them back. Um, but I guess I'm, I'm going to keep advocating uh, for, for, those, for those two both to be returned. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stephen. Claire, you mentioned, you know, the, Andrew didn't see it, but you put up a chart that said as you scaled, and particularly scaled across countries and rolled out projects across countries, you're actually getting that the effectiveness went up. So how do you embed that, you know, could, what are some examples from your experiences of, how did you embed the learning so that actually you did improve the cost effectiveness and did improve the outcomes as you sort of expanded programs? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think uh, coming back to another unsexy topic like implementation is monitoring data. So it sounds very boring to most people, but that was absolutely fundamental in our like successful replication where impact got better and better over time. Um, so what we do is every single week in this program we were evaluating, you measure what is the student taught, uh, whether they like got that test question correct that week, and then the following week, what level were they taught. So then you can back out from that how accurate was the targeting of the instruction to that student, which is an, a measure of implementation fidelity. So we had this weekly high frequency light touch data that helped us see if things were going completely off track in one treatment arm or on track in another. And then because we just like really nailed that system over each replication trial, and we just could re-emphasize to each new partner, this is like this monitoring data is a pain in the butt to collect, but it's super important. I think that was really key. And so we're pretty obsessive about monitoring data now. I think that's a really interesting theme to pick up too, and admin data and the importance of admin data. And so, Andrew, you've got this new Australian Centre for Evaluation, very exciting. Um, tiny budget for what you, your ambition is. Um, but how do you think that's going to help the development assistance program? Are you going to provide the sort of oversight that uh, Stephen's been hinting at? Or is it, uh, you know, where do you see it fitting on the development assistance side? No, thanks, Jenny, and uh, do feel free to uh, campaign publicly for the Australian Centre for Evaluation to increase its budget. I've got no... Uh, it wouldn't stand in the way of anyone doing that. Uh, the way it's going to work, though, is really important because uh, we need to draw a distinction between auditing and evaluation. Good audit auditing can be done at the very end. 
you can come along and figure out whether a program was uh, rorted, either for political reasons or the money stolen. Uh, an auditor can be there at the end and figure out what went wrong. Good evaluation, though, needs to start at the beginning. It needs to work in the program delivery. So at the last moment, when they were rolling out the Progressor conditional cash transfer payments to 250 villages in Mexico, someone said, you know, this is a two-year rollout. Why don't we just toss a coin, and decide, let the coin decide which villages get it in the first year and which villages get it in the second year? And that created one of the most important conditional cash transfer experiments, uh, which has now spawned a program that's operating in dozens of countries around the world. But you couldn't have worked out whether conditional cash, cash transfers benefited kids by coming along afterwards if the program hadn't been randomised at the outset. So with that notion, we're engaging in a very collaborative way across agencies. Uh, the Australian Centre for Evaluation isn't going to be sort of putting on its constable plod hat and charging into departments and evaluating them against their will. Uh, it's going to be engaging collaboratively. We've already got an agreement signed with the Department of Employment. Uh, we're looking at other agreements with departments like social services, disability, and hopefully also with DFAT. Uh, but like ODE did, ODE didn't sit outside uh, DFAT, it sat within DFAT uh, deliberately in order that it could work collaboratively with those implementing the programs, uh, and in this case, so we can work in setting up good evaluations from the outset. Thank you very much. There's so many questions. I've just got one more that I'd like to put to all three and get your, your views on before opening it up, because I know the audience will have a lot of questions. One of the things that I think um, we tend to think about evaluation, evaluation programs as bringing in some experts or training up and building the capacity of, you know, government staff or DFAT staff in actually evaluating it or for the people delivering the programs to do better. How do you actually use data collection, evaluation processes to build the capacity within the communities who are experiencing these development assistance? So how can we sort of make this a capacity building tool? Because ultimately, if the people receiving a program have that capacity to go, this is working, this is not working, and the sense that they want to get the best value out of that money, then that feedback loop might be one of the most important, and yet we haven't seen evaluation as a tool for that. So what are your thoughts on that? I have an initial observation. If I <laughs> Uh, so I think it's really important to ensure that everybody throughout the process understands why you're doing a randomised trial. Uh, if it's a natural experiment, you don't necessarily need buy-in. If it's a randomised trial, particularly operating at an individual level, you've got to have the people implementing the program and the people in the program understanding what's going on. In the early AIDS trials, they were testing some of the promising AIDS drugs and they didn't go through this process with patients. Uh, the patients then quite wisely said, well, half of us are getting saline, half of us is uh, getting a treatment that could save our lives. So let's just agree that we're going to swap over the cannulas uh, at lunchtime and then everyone will get half a dose of the good stuff. Uh, and that way we're more likely to save more lives. The experiment was completely ruined because the people who were part of the experiment hadn't had it explained to them that a good experiment would save the lives of people like them. Uh, so we've got to get buy-in. I think there's buy the buy-in issue around data collection is really important, Jenny, and that can uh, provide re really valuable training. Um, my dad worked uh, in uh, uni you know, university in Bandarache in the late 1970s, and they started off setting up the Ache Research Training Institute with the notion that at a university you build research first and then teachers flow in and then students flow in afterwards. And so one of their main focuses was getting people in and just training them to be good, objective collectors of data uh, in order to then build up and build up the institution. And I can take a stab at that one too. So I guess another part is like working with governments. So we uh, spend a lot of time like understanding existing government systems, existing data, data collection systems in the government on how they're like collecting learning data, for example, and then finding ways to make our data feed into their system so that then they can take credit for the education improvements that are happening and then feed that up, up the line. So I guess like finding out what's there, trying to complement it and then show that you can be useful. That's been really key. Um, 
Yeah, and then just fi uh, finding out what kind of data the governments, for example, or other partners are interested in, and because you have this data collection system going already, it's very easy to complement it by adding in new questions, for example. Okay, I'll, I'll have a go. Then I've, I mean, I'm glad I've had a bit of time to think about it. It's a really, it's a really tough question. I think one, th I, I'm going to say three things, I think, <laughs> if I get there. Uh, first is, you know, we shouldn't uh, gild the lily. Like, we should be honest. Like, we've been, Bill Easterly's name keeps coming up. And, you know, he always talks about the broken feedback loop. So that is an intrinsic problem of foreign aid or ODA, you know, that you're spending the money of one group of taxpayers uh, in another country. And so the recipients of that aid don't vote, right? Uh, you know, so that is sort of the fundamental weakness of development assistance. Uh, and I think there's a lot of truth in that. It doesn't mean, you know, that it's wasted money, uh, but it's an intrinsic problem. Uh, to solve. So I think that's the first reflection. You know, we shouldn't promise to solve every problem um, or overcome every weakness. Second, I think it just brings to mind that, you know, we're talking today about evaluation, maybe performance management, but that, as important as it is, you know, that's a small subset of what makes effective aid, right? I mean, effectiveness goes well beyond that. And I mean, I always think the most fundamental determinant of aid effectiveness is the, uh, the government you're working with, right? If that government is strong and capable and interested, you know, you can achieve great things uh, if uh, they're, they're weak and, and it doesn't really interest them. Uh, well, yeah, you're going to struggle, you know, no matter how good an aid agency uh, you have. Uh, and then I guess going on uh, from that, you know, I, I guess that, that sort of thinking, you know, is behind this uh, resurgence of interest in locally led development. And I guess you weren't here uh, this morning um, that we, we had uh, Deputy Prime Minister of Fiji uh, say, you know, if it's not locally led, it's not development. And I think a lot of people, uh, kind of that, that, that resonated with a lot of people. Um, and it's a big push in, in DFAT. So I think if you look at it from that lens, then, you know, your question becomes key. And uh, I'd, I'd tie it all together by going back to what Claire said, about implementation. You know, if you take a long-term perspective, then yes, you can do these things, you can build in uh, those systems. I'll finish with one anecdote. You know, when you started talk, your talk, Claire, I always, because I work a lot on PNG, and your know, education in PNG is a, uh, you know, a big uh, conundrum, how to improve it, and, and there was an RCT. And someone found that by sending out text messages to teachers with some very simple teaching sort of guidance and plans, uh, learning scores improved. And, you know, that was published, uh, it was a good quality evaluation, and I sort of went around and said, well, is anyone doing anything about this? And it had been totally forgotten. It's like, well, we've discovered something. You know, maybe it works in other countries, but actually we found it works in this country, but we're, we're not doing anything about it. So, you know, that is the complete lack of focus on implementation. And, you know, it does sometimes the incentives of donors, sometimes the incentives of academics, you know, are against long-term implementation. But I think if we take that long-term, if you think about, you know, finding out what works and then trying to apply it, I think then we can answer your question. Great, thank you. Now, over to you for questions. We have some roving mics, so stick your hand up. Yep, first one there. <laughs> thank you. Uh, my name is Zaid Iqbal, and I'm from SMIC, uh, Australia. We are participated in a lot of uh, development activities uh, around the globe. Uh, a quick caution to um, Andrew. Um, many of the time, we hear from the donor recipients that uh, Australia might not be doing enough. My point is aid is free money and loan and other things can be, uh, these are loan. So uh, is aid uh, right or it's a uh, privilege? So uh, that would be my caution. Thank you very much. Uh, I increasing foreign aid has been uh, one of the issues I've worked on probably the longest in my adult life. The first time I went to see a politician, I was 18, and went to see Philip Ruddock on behalf of an Oxfam campaign to uh, uh, boost the quantity and quality of aid spending. Um, less successfully, I dressed up as a clown to sell juggling balls in Hornsby Shopping Centre uh, to raise money for Oxfam. Uh, we're uh, proud as a government to have increased the, the aid spending, uh, but also to be focusing uh, on uh, the overall aid review and ensuring that we're getting more quality out of it. And I think that the, the discussion we're having today about ensuring we've got high quality evaluation wraps neatly around that. Not only does aid need to be inclusive, 
but we also need to do as good a job as possible of measuring what works, and we owe that most fundamentally to the recipients of aid. Just to add to that, I think one of the things, economists think about opportunity cost, so if we're spending this on this, we're not spending it on something else. And so negotiations with partner governments and other and agencies that receive Australian aid need that point about saying, you know, why should we spend it here and not there? So that they know it's contestable. Because the more that understanding that all dollars are contestable and you may not get them, if you you know, we would need to put them at the best possible use. Then, and that's why evaluation comes in as such an important area. But thank you for your question. Anyone else over here? At the back and then over here. Thank you. Uh, thanks to the presenters. Um, I just wanted to ask, in uh, the kind of the medium term, with a uh, like resource-constrained development program in real terms, uh, how can we uh, reasonably expect uh, like more rigorous and best practice um, programs and evaluation methods to be rolled out in any significant way uh, to really effectively uh, improve the development program over the long run. Okay, um, so I guess I don't have any institutional hats from DFAT anymore. Um, I guess what I see other countries do well maybe, also in resource constrained environments, in like USAID for example or FCDO in the UK, is I guess uh, so FCDO I know has like a business case situation. So with all new development spending, they have to justify in an evidence section, like prove that this program that you're arguing to spend on has a good evidence base to, to use. So I guess there's always constrained resources. So it's nice if there's an incentive, like in the institution from the top down, there's a signal that we care about evidence. So that would be one thing. And I think another thing USAID does quite well is they have this development innovation ventures kind of that sits a bit separate to the main USAID. And that gives that staff like the space to have a slightly different culture about risk. And so they can take some chances. Uh, they don't like shoot USAID's reputation in the foot if something is found to not work. Um, so it can, you can have a space, a breathing room for innovation and taking risk in, and maybe more evaluations there even if the rest of the institution is a bit, a bit more risk averse. So maybe those would be some thoughts. Uh, yeah, I could add, uh, thanks very much for that question. And that, you know, just to reprise my history lesson, I'm kind of showing my age with my, with my talk, but I think it is useful to go back into the dim distant past of 20 years ago. And uh, we definitely did benefit there from a sort of idea around more aid, better aid. I mean, that was when aid was scaling up and it's no accident you know, that's when the performance management system was put in place. That's when ODE was created. Remember, aid was initially scaled up under the Howard Downer government, a conservative government. So I think for them in particular, that idea, this is not just going to be more aid, it's going to be better aid. It's very important. So I think that dynamic did help, and that's no longer there. There have been some modest aid increases with labour, but generally there's no longer this idea aid's going to scale up. So I think that's one risk. And, and I think also the geopolitical competition I mean, you can argue, well, we want to distinguish ourselves from China, so we're going to uh, have more emphasis on quality. But I think in general that, you know, the more emphasis there is on geopolitical advantage, uh, the harder it is to prosecute an aid effectiveness agenda. So there are some tough sort of contextual or systematic forces at work uh, that should make us worry about the future. Uh, but I guess how is improvement going to come? Well, it's going to come from the people in this room and uh, the people in the sector and, you know, I, that's, you know, progress we've made so far, you know, we've learnt a lot. Uh, I think, you know, as a performance and evaluation is taken more seriously than it was uh, 20 years ago. So I, th I think, you know, there's no guaranteed outcome. I don't want to be naive, but I think it's, it's up to us. Uh, hi, Chris Roach from La Trobe University. Thank you very much. I, I, I hesitate to ask this question to a panel of economists, but I think I have to. Um, because my, my memory goes back to Robert Chambers asking the question, whose knowledge counts in the 80s? And I think if we're thinking about locally led development and we're thinking about empowering communities to hold other actors to account, then the politics of knowledge and the politics of evidence have to be part of the discussion. And I think there was some really rich discussion at the Australasian evalua Evaluation Conference this year, which you were at, Andrew, about this question of different forms of knowledge, different ways of knowing and being, and how we need a much more plural understanding of those things. And I think there was a fear 
that the Australasia, the new evaluation centre, in privileging randomised control trials and experimental methods as part of the definition of impact evaluation, was in there was a risk of diminishing other forms of knowledge. And you're, I hear you say it's not about 100% uh, RCTs, it's not about 0%. But the way it, the, we, your own website is framed at the moment seems to privilege those forms of knowledge. And I'm just wondering if you're, seeing, you're going to see that evolve in ways that recognize more plural understandings. Uh, thanks, Chris. I think that's a really important question. And, and certainly your discussion around local knowledge is, uh, is absolutely vital. I want to be clear, uh, we're not, when we're talking about the role that randomized trials play at the moment, they're not the oaks in the forest that are overshadowing the rest of the canopy. They're the tiny little seeds where there's just poking out of the ground. So the question is not, would we like the oaks to be a bit shorter? It's as the first little green shoots poke out of the ground, are we going to stomp on them and get rid of them and go back to 0% randomised trials? That's roughly where we are in terms of overall randomised trials uh, based on you know, lo looking across most fields in Australia with the exception of evaluation of new pharmaceuticals. Where we want to privilege local knowledge, I think, will be quite contextually dependent. Uh, so, for example, when COVID hit, I don't think there was a notion that communities would develop their own vaccines. There was very much an idea that there was a truth out there as to which vaccines were effective, uh, which vaccines gave false positives for HIV tests, like the University of Queensland one did, uh, whether masks were effective in preventing spread, whether masks weren't effective in preventing spread. Uh, conversely, if you're thinking about how uh, local government operates, I think that is going to be much more contextually dependent and you'll need to work with local, local actors because of the heterogeneity. Any evaluation needs to bear in mind its context. Uh, if you're doing a uh, before after study, you're still producing knowledge which is contextually dependent. A before after study conducted in Kenya won't necessarily translate to Kansas, just as a randomised trial conducted in Kansas won't necessarily translate to Kenya. So that ex issue of generalisability, I think we can separate from the issue of uh, uh, rigour and, and evidence hierarchies. I'd push an evidence hierarchy argument where we're very clear about the uh, goal we're trying to achieve, where there's less clarity of goals, I think you're absolutely right that a plurality of approaches are going to be the best fit. Thank you, Andrew. Questions? We've got one in the Barton oh, room, but we've got questions. Bertie over here and then this gentleman here. So. Thank you so much, Bridie Rice from the Development Intelligence Lab. Um, listening to the three of you speak, and, and Jenny, you're trying to pull this out, I think. Um, you've been posed the question, you know, how do we make Australian aid more effective? And interestingly, you're drawing um, a myriad of pathways in response to that. So we're hearing more focus on implementation, Claire, is, is one pathway. Um, Andrew, of course, you've got your evaluation centre out there and, and a really critical function that needs to be built there. Stephen, it feels as though you're saying, yes, evaluation, but actually this is about countervailing functions, institutions, second counselling, big decisions. And Jenny, you're, you're scratching these guys and saying, but hang on, everybody in this room just says, more Mel, more design, more skills, and we'll put a few extra people into DFAT, um, and this, this Mel and performance issue will be fixed. So I guess I want to put you on the spot, um, panellists, and, and say, if you were with limited resources to put your bet somewhere, where would it be around aid effectiveness? Is it really evaluation? Or is it some, something else? What matters most if we're going to improve the effectiveness of aid? <laughs> uh, okay, hopefully everybody has to be put on the spot with that one. Um, so uh, this is pretty hard to just drop in and change overnight, but it's hard to beat culture. Uh, it really needs to be from the top down, is like inculcating this sense that it's safe, it's important to evaluate, it's important to use evidence, and it's safe if things don't work. And I think, I have to say, I don't know that DFAT's quite that space at the moment, 
Um, it's hard to do in a bilateral aid agency, I have to say, but I do think FCDO might do this a little stronger. Uh, they also have a really strong in-house uh, cadre of researchers and, sorry, and, and evaluators. So yeah, I guess I'm not gonna get off the evaluation bandwagon. I think that's key, but also magically changing culture to make space for that. Okay, well, that's another really big question. And uh, I guess I was trying to draw the distinction between focusing on evaluation and maybe performance management, which is the focus of this session, and the much broader questions about aid effectiveness, because aid effectiveness is many more things go into aid effectiveness than whether you evaluate it well. And, um, you know, what I would do on aid effectiveness, I mean, I've, I've lost so many arguments, <laughs> so don't ask me. But, you know, <laughs> like I said, the most important thing is the countries you give it to. So I'd give more aid to Asia and less aid to the Pacific. You know, so that will probably offend some people. But that was what we argued in the 2011 aid review. But the government has gone in another direction. Yeah, I would uh, give less aid for governance uh, and more aid for, say, you know, the Rohingyas. Uh, in Bangladesh, right, for disasters and generally more, uh, yeah, for things that are more tangible. And actually one of the reasons for that is an easterly type argument that those things can be, are easier to evaluate and be held accountable for. But anyway, given that uh, none of those things are going to be uh, taken on board, I'll just <laughs> give one thing, you know, also to tie it back to evaluation and uh, maybe to, uh, you know, be a bit controversial. I, I, one risk I see, you know, nothing against all the fine design and uh, more people here, uh, at this conference, but, you know, one, we've definitely seen a sort of bureaucratization around Merle and log frames, and kind of one thing, okay, it's important, so every project's got to have it. And so, you know, some uh, projects I'm involved in, you know, I won't name them, <laughs> but, you know, maybe they're about research, right, or they're about uh, training economic students, you know, they're going to be really hard to evaluate, and uh, it's probably a waste of money to have a very detailed log frame. You know, it's like, uh, you know, there's a, so just such a general push, like to Im, Im, uh, evaluate the impact researchers are having. You know, it's not just in aid. So I think we should push back a bit on the bureaucratization of Merle uh, or m and &E, and that would save money. And then we can focus uh, on those projects where you can go in depth, you know, we'll do the impact evaluations, the RCTs. And for others, I think we should be content with like a good critical assessment. And that's probably the best you can do. So it depends what you define as evaluation, doesn't it? Is a good critical assessment really also an evaluation, right? Or is an evaluation only something that jumps certain hurdles that RCTs and data collection and things like that do? No, this, but what I'm saying is a good critical assessment in a lot of projects doesn't need a really detailed log frame. That's true. There's always a theory of change. Even in research, there's a theory of change as to why you do it. There is a purpose. And so testing that occasionally is not a bad idea, or at least testing it conceptually. Um, can I dive in on that one? Yeah, can I just finish? I'll make the point yeah, and then I'm going to let it hand over to you because I just wanted to say this one, is that I think that question, Bridie, is a really important one, but I don't think it's as simple as sort of, you know, let's about less evaluation and more money over here. Because I actually think that the capacity to think critically and, it, and do an evaluation on the fly, to think, you know, whether you, whether you call it evaluation or whatever, it's those skills that you bring to the conversation and the hard conversations about resource allocation and design that actually matter. And so the process of evaluation has to be built in capacity and it has to be built on capacity, not just in the people who are giving the aid or the people who are delivering the aid, but in the recipients of it as well. And I think that's the really critical thing we should be thinking about. It's not an ex post, do later to justify it should be part of the process and we need to build the capacity to think that through. And it's not just economic analysis, it's political economy analysis, it's all the other things that make things work. Over to you, Andrew. I think that's a terrific observation, Jenny. I did want to reassure Stephen, albeit that he's talking about the things that he's backed unsuccessfully, uh, that any objective evaluation of Stephen Howe's impact on overseas aid policy uh, would unambiguously find that he has been a force for good. <laughs> Uh, but in terms of what we might do, I, mean, I think, Bridie, one of the things that uh, we were really enthusiastic about uh, when we wrote the Global Commission on Evidence report last year was in getting the World Bank to more systematically focus on evaluation. Uh, and we encouraged the World Bank to devote a world development report to the issue of evaluation, which I think would crystallise a lot of these conversations and also bring a degree of focus and rigour to 
national aid agencies as well as to, to the work that the uh, international agencies do as well. Uh, James Batley from ANU. I guess um, my question was, w what are the meaningful ways of measuring the performance and effectiveness of the aid program as a whole, as distinct from an accumulation of the individual assessments that make up the whole? And I suppose I'm reflecting a bit on some of the comments that Jenny and Stephen made about the trade-offs involved. So. How does DFAT or how, how does the Minister assess the effectiveness of spending less in the Pacific and more in Southeast Asia or more through multilaterals and, and less funding through bilateral programs? I mean, where does that happen and, and can you make meaningful judgments about that? I'm really sceptical of this literature because the reverse causality problem. So you observe a... You observe a tsunami in, uh, in Indonesia and an outflowing of Australian aid money. If you look at the correlation there, you observe that there has been a lot of people died and we spent a lot of money, so clearly spending, spending the money was correlated with bad outcomes. Uh, and indeed, um, uh, there have been Australian economists who have argued we should stop giving money to Papua New Guinea because uh, of the negative correlation between us giving money to Papua New Guinea and Papua New Guinea's growth trajectory. So I, my view on evaluation is it's got to be much more granular, project level, in order to tease something out. Uh, because good aid, by its very nature, goes up when country, uh, outcomes in the country go down. Uh, well, the questions just keep getting more and more difficult. I mean, I hope we're going to finish soon. <laughs> oh, these are, you know, extremely difficult questions. How much aid should you give through multilaterals, you know, and, and reasonable people are going to disagree on this. So, yeah, it, it is a very difficult question. I get one reflection that comes to mind, you know, one area where I did have some influence. <laughs> that 2011 aid review, you know, we recommended this three-tier performance assessment. Like the first tier was, you know, how many people in poverty... I think, and the second tier was like in general, how many kids are Australia educating? Then the third tier were uh, more like uh, what, what percentage of projects are succeeding? Uh, you know, they, they were m much more at the operational level. And uh, that was taken up for a while, it was discarded, but it's been brought back. Uh, but I feel now, uh, perhaps, you know, listening to what, going along with what Andrew was saying, you know, it's really the third tier that, that matters. That's the one that we can really, really control because aid is a very minor determinant of overall development outcomes. So, but you can sort of get lost in those first two tiers. So I think really focusing on that uh, third level and things like uh, number of projects that succeed. I mean, not that you want 100%, but you, it's something you definitely want to track. Uh, I think one, you know, very good thing that uh, perhaps again, we had a role in, you know, we used to do this stakeholder survey where you asked uh, people implementing aid what they thought about it. And, you know, they're not the final beneficiaries, but they're one step closer. I think they have a, a key role. Uh, we did a couple of times. We ran out of energy. Uh, but DFAT's promised to do that as part of development policy. I think that is getting down to those operational questions where, where you can have the control and which you really want to uh, bring to the minister's attention. Okay, we've only got a few minutes left, but there is a burning question in one of the other theatres. So can you uh, ask quickly, please? Yeah, thank you so much. This is Dave Kelly beaming in from the... Martin Room um, from Linear International. Um, sorry, guys, it's another hard question, so we might need to um, grab some red wine and talk about it afterwards. But just interested for comments uh, from the panel uh, in relation to the, um, the current complexity for the Australian aid program, at least, and, and program managers in Canberra and at Post who are um, increasingly blending their development objectives alongside foreign policy and security objectives and what that means for effectiveness and evaluation of effectiveness. Thank you. David, how is that not a hard question? Because <laughs> uh, it goes back to the, the melding of, uh, of AusAid into DFAT and the challenges of uh, for somebody who is representing Australia of having to push the case for high quality evaluation uh, and to, in certain instances, say we funded a program that turned out not to work. Uh, I think this is really difficult, which is why we need to build these sort of structural features. Uh, the, 
uh, Australian Centre for Evaluation, the former Office of Development Effectiveness, do provide a systematic rigour uh, which ensures that we're not simply going for the path of least resistance, funding a program which makes the donors happy but doesn't have a, a real tangible impact on the ground. Uh, so those institutions, whether they're part of the multilateral system or part of our bilateral aid program, uh, are absolutely crucial. Um, no, I, 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 I agree it's a, it's a problem, but it's, it's been there all the time. You know, when I joined AusAid, I mean, the objective was to reduce poverty in the national interest, right? The AusAid was very clear that it had this dual mandate. You know, it used to have a triple mandate, sort of the commercial mandate was uh, abandoned, but it had this dual mandate. So it's always been there. Uh, but, yeah, I think as Andrew said, that's, that's why you need these countervailing institutions, you know, that are going to push back. And, yeah, they're not going to get rid of the national interest objective or the geopolitical competition, but they're going to push back... And, and try, nevertheless, to promote uh, you know, good performance management, uh, good evaluations, and hopefully uh, good aid effectiveness. And maybe just to follow up on that, I guess this also relates to the div US aid thing. It does help to have a slightly more independent, separate institution. So whether it's like a ODE equivalent in DFAT or the Australian Center for Evaluation, they can be the punching bag if something doesn't work, so that it, because it's just so difficult to do internally. I think the other thing is, it's always been there, security, national interest. In, and in fact, you need to make the case that having thriving, you know, economies and healthy people and the like is in Australia's national interest, period. So we want our neighbours to be doing well. We don't want them to be doing badly. I mean, clearly that enhances our security if they're all doing well. So we have a vested interest. And that's something we actually need to sell to the Australian public in order for them to support the aid program, because otherwise, you know, there's a lot of people who go, well, why would we spend there instead of spending on the people in poverty here and, and the like. So that's an incredibly important part. I think one of the challenges now, and this is with my Lowy hat on, is that if it's got security, somehow starts dominating other things. And so we need to make sure that investments in the name of security don't actually undermine other parts of security and don't undermine our international relationships because those are incredibly important as well. So I think we do have new challenges in the security front that we need to think about a little differently. And I think the evaluation methods are going to have to come to grips with that, and I don't think we know how to do that. We don't know how to deal with it terribly well in economics and trade off between you know, economic security and, and, and national security. But there are people who are thinking about this, and I think we've got to encourage them to think more. But on that note, having had the last word, I will give... Um, one last word, most important key takeaway for all our audience from each of the three of us before I thank you. Um, uh, okay, we'll, we'll bring back the Office of Development Effectiveness and the Independent <laughs> Evaluation Committee. Uh, maybe thinking uh, evaluation, yes, but also thinking about some of the unsexy detail in between that goes between the baseline and the end line, implementation and monitoring. Stay passionate about the goals, but be as scientific and critical about the means as possible. In other words, hold your programs loosely while you maintain an extraordinary passion about the goal that brought all of us into the room, which is reducing global poverty. Uh, join me in thanking Andrew, Stephen and Claire.